Hello um, and welcome. Happy holidays, everyone. I know the month of December is just full of so many wonderful celebration. So I hope everyone is having a lovely time with your friends and family. Um, but welcome to this Global Ballet Teachers um, new series called Backstage at the Ballet, um, hosted by Leora. I don't know where she is on your screen and myself. Um, and I'll, let me tell you a little bit about the series since it's new. Um, so watching live performances and recorded performances is such an awesome way to engage with the art of ballet. And fortunately, COVID forced the dance world to go more video focused for those of um, you who don't have access to live performances or world cast performances. Um, and so your viewers experience um, is enhanced by knowing more about each of the dances, whether it's a full length ballet, like the Nutcracker that we're gonna talk about or Swan Lake or Cinderella or something familiar, or one of the more contemporaries like we talked about um, in our last uh, video series. So this talk is aimed to give you insights and opportunities to learn more about the productions that we're going to show. Um, and Pacific Northwest Ballet, where I am a soloist dancer, um, is we have live performances, but we are also offering digital recordings of our opening night performance. So it's a way for you all to sit in our theater and watch our show. Um, and so Leora and I are digging into each of the programs that are being presented by PNB um, alongside the video recording that you can watch on your own time. Um, so without further ado, I would love to intro um, Leora Amit um, and let her tell you a little about a little bit about herself and then we'll get started. Oh, thank you. <laughs> if you're there or there. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, I am currently living in Canada and I do ballet appreciation programs for children um, here too because of the COVID um, uh, pandemic. Uh, public libraries where I was offering the programs have all shut down and all operations have gone online. Um, and I'm delighted that I have this opportunity to connect with all of you in this way. Um, also, the idea of following Pacific Northwest's um, repertoire, what they will be performing this season is also very kind of intriguing. Wow, because there are works that I have not come across yet in the past. But it's also been very interesting for me. Um, we've discussed um, how to approach each work as it comes up and trying to, um, to take, to adopt a perspective that is most beneficial for that work. Uh, and also we realize that you are a very varied audience with varied backgrounds, um, whether you're here today with us live or you will be joining later, um, it's hard to accommodate everybody's experience and needs. So we hope that um, this version of talking about the Nutcracker will be beneficial and enjoyable and interesting. But of course, there's always more to be said and everything can also be said from a different perspective. So tune in to other Nutcracker talks uh, for that. But for the moment, let's just concentrate on what we decided to do today, <laughs> which is talking about the ballet, all, all about a kitchen utensil, because of course we have ballets about forks and knives and staplers and dishwashing utensils, etc. But that's just my sense of humor. It works really well with kids. I needed to try it with you too. <laughs> so of course in the 19th century, where the story that um, E.T.A. Hoffman wrote, that it was the basis of the ballet, a nutcracker, a device for cracking nuts, was not so utilitarian. It could be very decorative. And there was a fashion at the time that devices that you would use to crack nuts would be dressed up like a soldier. And if you Google um, Nutcracker Museum, you will find different artifacts from different places and different periods that are all intended for cracking nuts. And they look like different, they are kind of animated to look like dragons or squirrels, um, squirreling away nuts, etc., or toy soldiers. So there's a lever at the end, it opens in the back, it opens the, the mouth, and you crack down on it real hard. And hopefully it's not your finger, but it's a nut. So the story that the ballet is based on was written by Hoffman for grown-ups way back in 1816. 
And it was many years before it actually made it and was adapted to something that would be presented on stage. And by that time, the story itself had also been written by Alexandre Dumas, et cetera, and adapted a bit here and adapted a bit there. And by the time the ballet premiered in 1892, um, there was also the work of the people working at the theater, at the Marinsky Theater, who created the libretto, the book of the ballet, the story, the way it will be told on the stage. So there are a lot of people kind of massaging and, and rearranging the plot and the characters and the names and the scenario, etc., to be compatible to what it's going to be like on stage. Add to that that there's also music that was composed specifically to accompany the plot, the ballet on the stage. And the composer that was commissioned to compose the music for the Nutcracker was Tchaikovsky, Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, two initials as well. And the custom at the time was that the music served the choreography. So the choreographer, the intended choreographer, Marius Petipa, he ended up being ill and his assistant Levi Ivanov did the choreography. But at the point of communicating with the composer, Petipa wrote very clear instructions to Tchaikovsky. I want eight bars with this mood. I want this. This part should be this number of bars long. It should have this mood. You can use these and these instruments. So that was the relationship. So the famous ballets that we are familiar with in the repertoire, in the world repertoire of classical ballet that were composed by Tchaikovsky were actually composed under those circumstances. And we have notes, the diary, the notes, the plans of both Petipa and Tchaikovsky and the instructions. And it's delightful for those of us who delight in these little things. So 1892 till today, it took a computer for me to figure out that it's 129 years. So on December 18, two days ago, we celebrated happy birthday, not cracker, 129 years since the premiere. And over those years, a lot of things have happened to the production of the Nutcracker. And two, two important for me notes, points to, to raise at this, at this time. If you did listen to the previous chat that we had about the going beyond ballet, and I emphasized so many times about how, oh, and this is so not like what they did in the 19th century, and this is totally breaking the rules of everything that they did in the 19th century. So today's chat about the ballet, The Nutcracker, is an example of how it was done in the 19th century. So you have a narrative work that spans the entire evening, although, on that particular evening, there was also an opera that was presented. It was a long evening. But the idea is that a whole narrative work is presented in several acts. The in this case, the first act takes place in reality, in real life, so to speak, with characters who are flesh and blood, human. And the second act is all uh, in the world of fantasy and dream and superhuman, supernatural characters. And now for the plot itself. I will share my screen at this point. Um, I took the liberty of taking using information from the website of Pacific Northwest Ballet because that is the production that you will have access to see courtesy of um, Cecilia and Pacific Northwest Ballet. So all the information is from that which was provided on their website. Um, so the Nutcracker Ballet, Pacific Northwest Ballet is very strongly affiliated with the Balanchine style, Balanchine technique, and they perform the choreography by George Balanchine that was premiered on the New York City Ballet, the company that he had founded in New York. The music, Tchaikovsky, no change. Scenic design costume, what I learned now through talking to Cecilia and researching this production, is that although the Balanchine Trust, which is um, dedicated to preserving the accuracy and authenticity of his works and supervised, these works are supervised by former dancers that danced in these works. Um, the choreography has to be, um, uh, you have to stick to it religiously. However, costume design and scenic design, there's more freedom there. And the different companies that dance the same choreography by Balanchine, you may see that they have different um, scenic design and costume design. So 
that was a surprise for me. I did not know. I thought they were all going to be like New York City Ballet, but no. Okay, so moving right along to the story. Now, because I'm kind of preparing the scene for there being a lot of variations on the theme, I'll try and outline what is the basic necessity for a performance in order for it to be considered as the nutcracker. You will receive, you will have access to this PDF document with the plot, the way it will unfold on stage at the Pacific Northwest Ballet Digital Performance. And I'm going to describe it in more skeletal, very basic minimum requirement terms so that we can see afterwards a few examples of how the story has been adapted. So two basic requirements seem to be that the music that is used is that by Tchaikovsky and every scene, every event that takes place is matched up to the piece of music that it was intended to. So you cannot use the march yum, -ram, -ram, bum, bum, from act one at the party. You can't use it act two for dance of the marzipans. You just can't. <laughs> you can, but you'll be breaking a lot of boundaries and a lot of rules over there. Maybe it's been done already. I don't know. So, and then the second requirement is that in terms of the plot is that there will be a celebration uh, celebrating the season of Christmas, um, whether in a party indoors or a party outdoors. Um, there are a lot of variations on that as well. There will be gift giving, there will be uh, dances and drinking and eating and celebrating and exchanging of gifts. And the key element that has to take place is the gift of the nutcracker. The nutcracker may be a wooden large size doll dressed like a soldier that can crack nuts, but we will see in, in, in another um, little pictorial presentation that it doesn't always have to be a doll sized nutcracker. The next, <laughs> next important element is that there will be somebody receiving the doll, so it can be um, uh, the, the daughter of the house. She could be named Clara, she could be named Marie, for short, she could be uh, named Masha, and I know that there are other variations on this theme as well, but somebody has to receive the nutcracker and feel something towards it. Um, and for the nutcracker to, to be part of the vision of this character and what will happen in the next act. So this will have been the real life um, act. The transition into the second act of this ballet takes place as a, excuse me, a voyage in the cold uh, blowing winds and snowstorm of what would be Europe uh, in December. <laughs> and of course, in other places around the world, that may not be the case. And there's even a ballet that, that offers Nutcracker in a different climate and a different geography altogether. And I, I'll be able to show a little bit of that as well. Um, so Clara, with or without the nutcracker who turned into a prince, with or without a young gentleman who is actually the nephew of the uncle, the magician, Drasselmeyer, who gave, it, doesn't matter. We go, we travel, we blow through the forest and the dance of the snowflakes. And they too have been reimagined in many, many ways. I actually did, with all the excitement of the nutcracker, there's gotta be a battle as well. I'm sorry, Clara, will start her imaginative journey with a battle in her living room of mice and toy soldiers. And she will be instrumental in killing the, the, the scary seven headed um, rat king, but all in a day's work. Voyaging into the world of fantasy and illusion and dreams, we come to act two, which is in the original would be the land of the sweets with a uh, sugar plum fairy reigning supreme with all of the sweets being her subjects and all of the the um english sorry the sweets in the kingdom um dance before clara with or without the prince with or without drosselmeyer who's also sometimes there as well um, bringing sweets from different corners of the, of the world. So we'll have dances that, according to the original, 
the libretto, the book, and Tchaikovsky's score, we will have a Spanish dance for the chocolate and a Chinese dance for the tea and um, a dance for marzipans or uh, merlitons. They will be called a little bit different. And the idea is that, again, in that format of 19th century ballets, there was a certain in the era, there was a fascination with otherness, other cultures and other flavors. What can we bring to make this feel kind of more interesting? So if we have an entire ballet, which is in Spain, there will be some incorporation of movements that are considered Spanish. They bring something from Spanish culture, but they're adapted to the ballet stage. And similarly, further in the season, we will see Pacific Northwest Ballet doing Swan Lake that will also have delegations or princesses who are candidates for the prince to marry, who will dance dances that are inspired by different localities. So they're not trying to be ethnologically accurate and represent in very accurate terms. This is what in the 19th century on the ballet stage was the idea of how to infuse something a little bit different and exciting. And these two have been adapted in many, many different ways over the years and in different versions. Um, how do we go back? How do we finish this ballet? So in finishing the ballet, there's also more than one version. <laughs> there is sailing off into the sunset, or rather, if you can see in the larger picture on the right, being pulled through the sky on a sleigh being pulled by reindeer. Um, that's one way of finishing off. Another way, other ballets will do a quick stage change um, and bring us back to reality with Clara having fallen asleep on the uh, couch in her living room and waking up with her nutcracker in hand and realizing that all of this was just a dream. So there are also multiple versions of that. If I try to summarize, and I know this is a long meander, we need the Tchaikovsky score, the music, and we need the story to more or less follow those guidelines of the reality, the doll, the fantasy, and wrapping it up somehow. How do we walk away from this experience? Um, over to you, Cecilia, just for a little minute while I switch around my uh, documents here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, thank you for that kind of high level overview of the Nutcracker. It's interesting um, performing the Nutcracker for so many years. I've danced professionally in two companies and both have pretty similar story and dance choreography, but looking at different companies around the world, especially, it's amazing to see like Okay, the general skeleton, as Leora said, and then very different interpretations. So um, I know that Leora is going to go into a couple different versions. There are endless, and I know she wanted to cover every <laughs> single one, which we can't. But for example, there's one in Hawaii. And so obviously they're not going to have a party indoors. They're going to have it outside and they're going to be pineapples. But that would not be the case in this PNB. Balanchine version where it's set in Germany. Um, there aren't <laughs> pineapples there. So um, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it to you um, to, to carry it away. Okay, thank you. Um, so I would like now to, to, all right, I will start by apolog apologizing. I don't, <laughs> If I am creating the impression that this is all so confusing and there's this and there's that and there's the other one, it is because the Nutcracker is a case study of something which is indeed more fluid than a lot of the other classics. The, those works from the 19th century and mostly that are revered and held on a pedestal and oh no 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 you don't mess around with those you do them exactly as they were and you and you safeguard the tradition and you don't change anything whereas the nutcracker oh has has lent itself rather easily to a lot of changes so in this little powerpoint presentation i would like to bring examples for one um now this is a ballet called the Hard Nut. So it's also a play on words. It's by a modern dance company uh, with a choreographer and the name of the company, Mark Morris Dance Company. And the whole era 
the, the time in history when this uh, story is being presented is 20th century. It's not 19th century Germany, it's 20th century somewhere. Not only that, but the dancing dolls in the first act are futuristic imaginations of mechanical robots. And if we talk about the party scene, then some productions will have real live children playing the role of children. And these are not children that are performing to their parents for their end of the year recital. Sure, their parents may be bought a ticket to come and see it. These are children that are trained in schools, in feeder schools. When there's a big ballet company, many times there will be a feeder school that will train dancers to the level and in the style that the ba main ballet company requires and they will hire their dancers from there. So part of their training experience will be to perform in roles that are um, intentionally made for children. However, using children in the first act can be limiting because of what they, the, the, what they can do as dancers. And that can also uh, present some problems for developing the plot for the second act. So in the picture on the bottom, for example, from um, the Marinsky Theater, if I'm not mistaken, um, the dancers are older. They're more experienced. You can use point work with them. In other versions, you have full-fledged grown-ups principals with a ballet who are dancing the role of Clara, for example. And it's that same Clara who will be in the second act and will dance um, the role of the Sugar Plum Fairy. But that's just to make life more confusing because, hey, this is ballet. There will be other productions where the entire story, we said it has to have the music, it has to have follow certain things, this is um, Jean-Christophe Maillot of um, Ballet de Monte Carlo. And he is the choreographer of the next work at Pacific Northwest Ballet's uh, repertory for the season, Romeo and Juliet. So that'll be interesting. It's the same choreographer. So he took the entire, um, all the events and put them within the framework of a ballet company working, rehearsing, performing, the dynamics between the director and the dancers and the principal and the favorite and the, the, the black sheep, et cetera, et cetera. The score continues to be Tchaikovsky. The events are parallel to those of the plot. So instead of a nutcracker doll, the new arrival is a new choreographer. Um, Another contemporary modern dancer is um, Matthew Bourne, working in England. And he took the whole story and put it in the first act in an orphanage. And these poor downtrodden little kids who have a very gray monochrome, unloved life, receive presents from some uppity uh, philanthropic um, high society people. and. The doll that is received in the first act over there is the one that is uh, that that is the main character, the presence in the second act, sweets and everything, and then coming back to reality at the end, the uh, doll remains in human form, the prince, the savior, in a little bit of a sense, and they escape the orphanage. It's another way of of taking that story and reinvigorating it and breathing life into it. And I mentioned that even the doll itself can be in different forms and shapes and can actually be a real flesh and blood dancer. So the manipulation of the doll and dancing with the doll in the first act is not going to be a little article of, you know, carried in the arms, but a real a, a doll that can actually dance as well. Prop to human. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Human prop coming up. <laughs> um, I even discovered that there's a hip hop nutcracker. So this is, let's see if my humor will pass here. This is where the battle of the mice and the soldier is a dance battle and it takes on a completely different meaning. Yay, I don't know. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> and and all of that and all of that um, uses a different uh, movement language, a different dance idiom altogether of urban dance. 
Um, and the, the music, although following the Tchaikovsky tunes and melodies, is also manipulated in terms of the beats. And that's all I can say about street dancing and, and beats. I'm, I'm so sorry. It does not mean any disrespect <laughs> to any genre. <laughs> in terms of productions being somewhat unique and standing out. So when you will see the Pacific Northwest Ballet production, uh, which is George Balanchine choreography, you will see that Clara and the prince slash the nephew of Drosselmeyer who brought the, <laughs> the Nutcracker, they are the characters who go through the different imaginary worlds. And not only that, but, you know, but emphasizing the idea that this is perhaps a, a dream of Clara's. You will also see her lying on her bed. And I am vaguely related through marriage, seven times removed to somebody who was in the School of American Ballet and had the role of moving the bed around. Mm -hmm. So when you see the bed moving around on the digital uh, performance that you will see, there's a boy underneath there. Maybe they're doing girls as well now, I don't know. You would do you did that once? So it's at now called to be politically correct, the bed person. Okay. Um, and I, when I was in the school, I wasn't the actual person underneath the bed because at the time it was just boys, but now they're expanding to young women as well. Um, but I was on the, the stage hand mic and the person under the bed has headsets on. So you can tell them like, oh, more to the right, more to the left. Oh, faster, do your spin, spin, stop. Um, so That's I was amazing. that person who did it for a couple of shows. And I, I just remember <laughs> being so stressed, but also so fun. Um, but we could we could go so deep into that, but we have, I know a lot of other things to cover. Yeah, but. oh, it's a, such, a, such a wonderful thing to have you with all of your in inside yeah. information. <laughs> Okay, so, so that production stands out in that respect. Um, other productions that stand out in other respects, the National Ballet of China took the Nutcracker story and transposed it to Chinese New Year celebrations. And all of the themes, all of the decor, all of the costuming, all of the dancers were adapted to Chinese culture. So what we know of as the snowflake, wal waltz of a snowflake, is danced by cranes, which is a type of a bird, which is considered to bring good luck and being uh, a sign of auspicious uh, you know, good uh, fortune. Um, the Win Royal Winnipeg Ballet has polar bears because you know it's snowing and it's Canada, so that's a it's a no brainer. You'll have that. So there there are a lot of opportunities to go off script a little bit with the Nutcracker. Um, Mark Morris again from The Hard Nut, um, another wonder that you can watch documentaries that talk about this, about how the snow falls, etc. the technical element from the backstage. Um, so in The Hard Nut, the dancers are themselves the ones who spread the snowflakes. Um, they throw them up in the air. It, I think you can see it even in this photo that the dancers, although they are all dressed the same in a way which is reminiscent of ballet costume, they are men and women uh, dancing the Waltz of the Snowflakes. And some ballets even have a role, a special role of a snow queen uh, to, to offer an opportunity for the premier dancers in the, in the ballet company to perform. Uh, but for the most part, the Waltz of the Snowflakes is a corps de ballet dance, an ensemble dance. And now we get to the dances of all of the suites. And um, before we stray yes. away from the snow, because I loved how yes. you went through all the different snow scenes, you may be wondering, what is the snow on stage? Um, and many of you may know, but I'm maybe going to open up some doors. It literally is hole punched paper. So you take a piece of paper and you take the hole puncher to put like in school when you have the binders with the three holes. It's that just a million of them. Um, and so they actually sweep them. Exactly. Yeah, just those hole punched pieces of paper. Um, <laughs> and depending on the version, whether you're throwing the snow or it's coming from above in the rafters or being blown on by fans, um, 
just thousands of little pieces of hole paper holes and then the stage hands sweep them all up and then use them again the next show so not the most hygienic but that's just the way it goes because you can't have brand new show snow every single show um so just wanted to throw that in there yeah it's, it's another good reason why you have the intermission after the snow because you can't continue without cleaning up the stage then oh yeah it takes to- them 15 minutes to sweep it all up <laughs> so and we have i think we have a huge crew. So I think they're about five or six stage hand sweeping and it takes them 15 minutes. So that's how much snow there is. But I know this version, this is San Francisco ballet um, in the United States. They have the like most snow in any production. They like have a downpour every single show. So um, yeah, this this photo is an example of, of a, a large amount of snow. Yeah, a lot of snow. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Um, The sweets. Um, We are going to linger a little bit on the Spanish dance just after I'm a couple more pictures. And this picture is just to indicate that the Spanish dance can be a duo with, you know, with classical ballet and, you know, the ballerina is on point. It can be a trio, it can be a group, and it can also use character shoes. So, um, we'll get, we'll see if we get to talk about character shoes, but part of the uh, national dances that appear from time to time in ballets, they are often not performed in ballet shoes, either soft or point, but in character shoes. So the Spanish chocolate. The, I, I, I love this. <laughs> this is a, another version that was performed at the Marinsky at one point. Um, I don't think it's there in repertory all the time. They also have other versions of the Nutcracker. Um, The piece of music, which is designated as coffee from Arabia in this production, has a a solo dancer being brought in in a very, very large uh, basket and taking on the spirit, at least, and movements of a cobra, which is enticed out of its basket by a snake charmer. That's what we would call them in English. Um, Maybe there are other terms or something in another country that describes it differently. Um, Chinese dance, I really enjoyed discovering this. Um, So of course, this is not a representation of anything going on in the the 19th century, how one would imagine China would be in those days. This is post um, the Cultural Revolution and the rise of communism in China. I thought that was a nice touch. Um, And the one example that I was able to find that takes place in a different climate and different continent is a version that was uh, presented by the Joburg Ballet, Johannesburg Ballet in South Africa. And what we know of as the Russian dance, the Trepek, which in Pacific Northwest Ballet are the candy canes, um, is in fact gumboot dance from South Africa. So this is a dance that is based on the tapping, the sound and of the tapping on the rubber boots of mine workers. Um, I, last but not least, um, within the sweets, I have marshmallows. And it was important to mention, to show a picture of marshmallows, just in case we have a cross-cultural barrier here. And these pretty little girls are in um, Matthew Bourne's production. Uh, Waltz of the Flowers, if we go back to the National Ballet of China and every suite being something from Chinese culture, then this is the waltz of the Ming Dynasty porcelain. <laughs> that was a beautiful touch. I think the, the ladies with the tutus kind of look like teapot um, lids. I've never <laughs> seen this. This is gorgeous. My yeah, gosh. isn't it? Um, another unique role that exists in George Balanchine's production is the role of the dewdrop as part of the flower waltz. So similar to the waltz of the snowflakes, where you may have a solo uh, dance within the corps de ballet. Here too, you have somebody who stands out and separate a little bit from the corps de ballet within that piece. Um, And in terms of overall meaning and what does the second act mean, uh, in the Bolshoi ballet's choreography by Yuri Grigorovich, 
the coming together of, of Maria, Marie, Maria, Masha, and the prince, and floating off into dreamland and fantasy land actually represents the, the, the teen, the child imagining herself coming of age and marrying her prince. So there's no room for imagination here. It is very much intended by the choreographer. So it's a little bit of a manipulation of the storyline in order to convey this interpretation. So now. Well, I, I, yeah, I just want to point <laughs> out that I think what's so interesting about all of these different versions of the general plot line and then different versions of all the different divertissements in act two that we know as the land of the sweets in some versions and others, it's like different interpretations of one culture, like the Chinese version. Um, I think as teachers of all of you that are on this call and going to be listening, your takeaway should be if I were to do a nutcracker or be part of a nutcracker in my school, literally the options are endless. These are just the like structural things that um, other versions do, but they're really like a dance for, we'll talk about the Spanish, can be a solo, can be a duet, can be a trio, can be a group dance for your level three students. Like really the, the opportunities are endless. So I think that's the biggest takeaway that um, I see as a teacher watching everything that Lior put together is like the opportunities are endless and these are just ideas for you to go run with um, as you create your own either entire Nutcracker productions or just like a suite if you do a couple um, pieces from it. Um, yeah. yeah, I guess before we move on, I'd love to hear from people who are on the call live. Um, what versions have you seen and really enjoyed? Um, or maybe what would you want to do for your students? And go ahead and unmute if you want. Also, if you don't want to share, that's fine. I've seen many of the of the different versions, but Russian versions mainly. So I was really curious to see the American one, the Balanchine one. Uh, I hope it will be available online. So yeah. Um, but yes, I've seen a version uh, in the Kremlin Ballet, which is very similar to the Bolshoi Ballet as well. I've seen the Bolshoi one. And I think I've seen, yeah, and I've seen the Matthew Bourne one, but not live. I've just seen the video because I was really curious to see um, his version. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to say this at the end of the call, but the PNB version is going to be available today through the 28th. And I'm going to share the link with everyone after this call with with this link as well. So you can rewatch or watch if you aren't here. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing, Alexandra. <laughs> Um, yeah, anyone else want to share? Cool. Um, yeah, so we have one more section of this um, chat uh, before we will leave you to have a wonderful rest of your day wherever you are. Um, and I think I, I, I'm going to do a little talking now um, and say, like, now we're going to focus a little bit more on the George Valanchine's version um and what roles have i done that's a very tough question because i've actually done this version since i was nine years old um, when i lived in new york city where i trained as a student so as Lior was saying the feeder schools so new york city ballet is where this this particular version of the nutcracker is originally done and the feeder school is the school of American ballet and that's where I was fortunate enough to train and now I live on the other side of the country um so as a student I was a soldier in the battle scene I was a mouse in the battle scene um I was a Paula Chanel um which is like one of the little um I think during the gumdrop dance um and then a candy cane as well um, I was too tall to be an angel and a party scene, which was always heartbreaking as a student, but now I get to be in those parts anyway. So it all worked out in the end. Um, but now as a professional dancer, um, I play the role of Clara's mom, um, which I adore. It's a lot of acting, not too much dancing, um, but she's kind of the host of the party. Um, and then I do a lead Spanish 
um, the Arabian coffee, uh, Demi flowers, which is one of the soloists, Waltz of the flower dancers, the dew drop, which is that beautiful green costume that you saw. And then the sugar plum fairy. So I do six roles and here at PNB, we do 37 shows from the day after Thanksgiving, which was, I believe, November 27th, all the way through December 28th is our last show. So we have two shows every day coming up and it's, it's a hard, hard time physically and mentally, but it's just so fun to be back performing um, live. So that's just a little bit of background of like, I, I really know this piece extremely well. I've been doing it for 20 years for the most part. Um, so we're going to dig in a little bit into the Spanish dance. Um, and I know Leora kind of already mentioned several versions. They can be a duet, it can be a trio, it can be a group dance. Um, in the George Balanchine's version, um, there is a leading couple, so a man and a woman, and then there are eight, uh, sorry, eight dancers, four couples behind them doing similar movements, but slightly simplified. So the couple in the front is doing the more challenging steps, and then the corps de ballet in the back is doing a little bit of a simplified version. Um, yeah, Leora, you want to take it away? Would you like me? So what, again, it, it's hard to not talk about everything because there's so many, so many important things to say, but if, if we as ballet teachers, ballet dancers, those who are, who are trained in the language of ballet, so our bodies have been trained to speak ballet, and then we are called upon to dance in a style which is not ballet, in a style where you may be making noise either with the shoes that you're wearing or with an instrument that you're holding in your hand. You may be using the palms of your hands and your posture and your arms in general in a way which is, oh no, it's a sin in ballet, you can't do that, that's true. In ballet, your palms will be facing inward. In flamenco, your palms might be facing outward. Flamenco is one type of Spanish dance. Um, if one, the different positions that may be incorporated into a dance, which is Spanish in ballet, it may not be accurately Spanish, but hands on hips. Where in a ballet class do we ever assume the position of hands on hips? We don't because it's not part of the ballet vocabulary, strictly speaking, but it is part of the character dance vocabulary when we want to bring in those um, unique flavors from different parts of the world. Dancers may, may manipulate objects like a shawl or a fan. So different ballet choreographers taking on choreographing the Spanish dance and the other dances from different countries will take elements and manipulate them in a way which is, gives us a hint that, oh, that's Spanish-ish, but it's not attempting to be exactly accurately Spanish. And this is where I throw it back to Cecilia to, to see if uh, she can show us um, as teachers, how can we manipulate movement material with our students? Yeah, well, if you don't mind, because I know you have the recording, I think it would be yes. good to watch that first and then we can okay. talk about it. So I'll talk a little bit while you're getting that set up. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think the, the biggest elements for most Spanish dances is the costume really helps. Um, a nice big skirt that you can swoosh around. Um, a headpiece, probably like a big, big thing. Or as Leora said, like fans or castanets. Um, so this version is done in point shoes. Um, but you can tell by the costume, like it has a different, oh, sorry, not by the costume, by the video, it has a different flair than like a normal ballet solo or dance would, where it's very classical. You can see the first position, the fifth positions, all the like basic ballet vocabulary that you know. This kind of translate, translates it a little bit more to flamenco. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and let you um, watch a little bit. Um, yeah, so here they're settling in Marie and the Prince to sit and watch the, the sweets dance. And that's the sugar plum fairy in the middle there with the Spanish men on the side moving the furniture. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for the screen recorder. They updated the version and now it's there. No Sorry worries. 
so this is just a sugar plum fairy um introducing her her friends and characters that are going to be dancing for the next 30 minutes <laughs> And down, you can see how their arms are different. Like they're going behind their back, which is like, what? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. No worries. And you can tell in the music too, all the, the castanet sounds. So the dancers don't have the cast nets in their hands, but it's in the music, it's in the energy of the piece. Awesome. I apologize. It's not, <laughs> there's something or other going on with the synchronizing of the uh, movement and the music. No worries. So. <laughs> um, and maybe while I'm talking, you could leave the video on with no um, volume and I can yes. just talk through it. Um, that would be wonderful. Um, so yeah, it's such a fun, fun part to play. Um, it's, I think, a minute and 30 seconds long and you are just jumping and um, balancing around. It's, it's such a fun piece. I actually performed it last night um, and had a really, really great show. But um, yeah, I think the main elements, let me um, move so you can see me a little bit more clearly. Um, but you see all of these movements where you have one hand behind the back and one in the front and like it's a little I'm even just marking it and I have like my hips and my shoulders moving and that's bringing in that flamenco characteristic. Um, also there's snapping um, that you maybe can't hear from the audience or from the recording but the dancers are snapping and then coming up to positions like this as well are a little bit more flamenco so if you had I took flamenco class actually when I was a student and you'd come to this position to do your cast net so as I said the dancers don't physically have the cast nets in their hands but they're impersonating where they would be um and then also like hands on the hips and like giving more a palmon shoulder diagonals than you maybe would in like a classical position or variation where everything's very square in Spanish dancing, you want to have more of that epoma and like shoulder movement to kind of show a little bit more like sassiness and like, I don't know, um, I don't exactly have the words for it right now, but um, I don't know, when I'm performing and I have such a fun time like trying to to twist my body as much as possible because that's so different than what the rest of the ballet is, which is very, very square. Um, and then as you can see here, the long skirts really help exemplify the big movements. Um, and I, I love this, these costumes too. I grew up with these. Ours are very different um, with like big stripes underneath, but um, all of them are different colors. So they're kind of exemplary of like um, different flavors of hot chocolate. So you can, this one's like caramel hot chocolate with like the brown, or you could do raspberry hot chocolate or whatever the other colors are, you can imagine what they are on your own. Um, but each, yeah, so there's purple, there's pink, there's blue, and there's uh, red. So um, that's kind of fun, a fun detail as well. Our skirt at the PNB version is high and low, and like it's a lot more swooshy and actually kind of hard to manage because it's so heavy. There's so many ruffles. So that's also part of how movement is different. Um, yeah, I think that's um, most of the points um, of like what makes a, a Spanish dance more Spanish. Um, but yeah, I'll take, I'll leave it to you, Leora. Um, I took the liberty of bringing a couple of examples. I don't have to, we don't have to do all of them, but what it would look like um, on students, students who are not being trained to be professional dancers. Um, to, I think perhaps it may be a bit too big of a distance 
um, to try and adapt something from a professional performance onto students. And maybe it can be helpful to see what it would look like when students are performing. So I'll just switch over to something like that. So this is again an example where Drosselmeyer is the one who accompanied Clara. <laughs> And that was even mimicking a movement that is associated with the uh, bullfighter fighting. Hands on hips, stands, stomping and clapping. Wait for it, there'll be. I will just yeah. say that version is way harder than the version that we do. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like so much younger. That was very impressive to watch. <laughs> there are simpler versions as well. If are we, I think, I, I, you know, I can drag this on forever. Um, but, but it is, so again, far be it for me to be the authority on the subject. But it is possible to simplify the same movement to repeat it several times, to repeat it to the other side, to have one, if you have one row of kids facing the audience, the other row of kids with their back to the audience, it creates a richness and texture to the choreography. So it doesn't all have to lean on the virtuosity and the technical ability of each and every dancer. It can lean more on um, formations and structures. So rows and lines and circles um well and good rhythm building rhythm building as well which flamenco is so known for with the clapping and the snapping and like um I mean, we've talked a lot about musicality and so just um yeah incorporating that and the movement quality rather than the verse the like difficulty and excellence of hard technical movement um yeah but um we will share more versions with you um, with links. And of course, YouTube is everyone's friend and you can find a bunch of different versions yes. on there. Um, but to close, I know Leora has an incredible resource. It's, it's um, a find that I must share with the world. Yes. So um, this PDF document is going to be accessible to you um, along with the other materials from this backstage um, chat. These are a few links to a few versions, some of which we've touched on. The, the big find that I must share with the world, I can take no credit for it whatsoever. I discovered that the Royal Opera House in London um, has a lot of um, resources for teachers to work with students in schools. Now, the way they've set it up is that you can you can produce the Nutcracker Ballet in your school with regular kids, kids who don't necessarily do any extracurricular afternoon uh, studying of ballet or dance or anything structured. This is something that you can take to your classroom if you're the physical education teacher. It does revolve around the um, curriculum that is. Um, part of the education system in England, but it is accessible to all. It is free. All you have to do is 
sign up register. So I'm going to switch over to the version where I'm already signed in and I have access to all of the materials that they offer. And I'd like to just walk you through how to access it so that you have an idea, is this worth my while or not worth my while? So the link that I provided will bring you here to um, learningplatform.roh or the UK program, Create and Dance Nutcracker. They also have- We can't see your screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and you waited all of this time to tell me. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, this should do it. I, I apologize. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> <laughs> a bit embarrassing. Yes. So this is the, the uh, document that you will have access to. These are the links to additional productions. And this is the link to the teacher resources on the Royal Opera House website. Um, you have to sign up in order to have access to all the material. And this is what it would look like. So over here, hi, Leora, your account. That's because I'm signed in under my user. So there's an introduction about the, what this could look like. Welcome to Create and Dance the Nutcracker. And they have several levels of courses. So you can see a Nutcracker taster. That one has two 60 minute lesson plans that are prepared for you. You can do a more extensive one with five 60 minute lessons and it's broken down into activities, what to do with your class. And there are things for you to watch so that you understand what the objective of this activity is and how you can do it with your students. And then the third example, the Nutcracker Immersive has 10 60 minute lessons. So I'll click into view course. I'll close this. And this, of course, there's an introduction. This 10 week program has been created. I mean, you have to, you, you, it's recommended to read it because that's how you'll understand better what to do and what their, the intention is. And for each lesson, you have so much detail. I, I, I love, like, how, how can you not <laughs> want to do this? And what to do for each part with little video, um, video, there it is, the video and they have explanations. Now, some of it may have the narrator saying, I'll be in your class every week, but the intention only is to say that you will see me on the, on the tutorial every week. And you can do it anywhere in the world, even if he's not coming into your classroom in person. Um, this seems to me like a wonderful opportunity, which is why I felt strongly about sharing it. And thank you, Cecilia, for giving me the option of everybody, you gotta do this. Yeah, no, thank you so much. It's such an incredible resource and I need to dig into it more to learn to learn more. And maybe we can create a whole other series here at Global Valley Teachers where we take those resources and just like walk um, teachers through it and talk through like what different versions people had and things like that. So the opportunities are endless, but um, amazing to have that resource. So um, again, we'll have that all linked up for you to research further if you're interested. Um, but yeah, maybe before we part, are there any questions from anyone who's here live um, on the Nutcracker or anything else? Oh, there's something in the chat. <laughs> Um, well, of course, you know how to reach us if there are any questions or anything comes up, but we will be um, sharing this conversation um, on recording on YouTube like we usually do. Um, and I've actually recorded myself teaching this, a part of the Spanish dance, the George Balanchine version, um, and I've broken it down um, so you can teach it to your students or simplify, kind of take what I've done and simplify it even more or make it more complicated, whatever. Um, so there's a little bit of a tutorial on how to do the dance. Um, and then I will share the link that PNB has blasted out and launched um, of our version that we performed just a month. I mean, we're still performing it but it was uh recorded a month ago um now and you get to watch the performance and fast forward and rewatch and do all the things so um I will send out a big email with all of that and Leora's resources as well that were just so wonderfully put together thank you so much for doing that um 
And so I hope this information is helpful for you as teachers to take to your studios and either just teach them the Spanish dance or do a whole version of the Nutcracker or Nutcracker Suite where you just do a couple diverse months. Um, yeah, just as an inspiration or just even teaching your students about the Nutcracker and the different versions is also really interesting. Um, so I hope you take away something from this conversation and thank you so much of those for those of you who joined live and those that are going to watch this um, afterwards. So grateful for you. Um, and please, as always, let us know if you have any feedback, um, what we can do better, what you'd like to learn more about. Um, we are here to create the series for you and what you want to get the most out of it. So thank you, Leora, so much for all of your work putting it together and your wonderful props. <laughs> we thank you so much. Um, and you. we will see you all soon. Happy holidays. Um, Happy holidays and everybody. yeah, Leora, I'll let you close it out. Oh, no, that was beautiful. No, no, no. Take a bow. <laughs> <laughs> you're the dancer <laughs> oh you're so sweet um oh yeah also in the recording I will be dancing Clara's mom and the soloist Demi Flowers so you'll see me in like an orange big dress um but I'll make sure to point that out um in the emails so anyway thank you so much for joining us happy holidays and we'll see you in the new year thank bye you. you all bye -bye. thank you happy holidays <laughs>